Good morning, everyone. It's my joy to get to be with you in the beginning of our new year and to share some inspiration that Swami Kriyananda has laid out for us through these two magnificent readings from the Bhagavad Gita and the Bible. And to begin, I'd like to tell you a story. So for those of you who don't know, I had the great good karma of being born at Ananda Village, which was the first of the Ananda communities founded by Swami Kriyananda. And so because of that, I had the great good uh, fortune of growing up amidst universal spiritual techniques. So I was taught to meditate probably before I could recite my ABCs, they went hand in hand. And I was taught devotional chanting and how to pray, though I was never taught what to pray, but merely how to offer my heart. And as I grew, spirituality and my experience of life went hand in hand. But I didn't fully flower as a devotee. Hopefully, I still haven't yet fully flowered, actually. But um, my teenage career didn't fully flower until I was about 16. And at that time, I had a spiritual renaissance. And I began to see that the true purpose of my life was to seek God. And that became increasingly clear in my own mind and in my own heart. And I had a transformation, a great transformation because of that. And subsequently, some of my old friends were a little bit confused because all of a sudden there was a version of Keshava who wasn't the same man they all knew uh, six months ago. And so one day I found myself in conversation with one of my dearest friends. And he said, you've changed so much. Help me to understand, what, how are you leading your life now? What is, what is different? And I began telling him about my quest for God and my great devotion and my aspiration to be a true yogi. And we had a very open-hearted conversation. And at one point, he said to me very sincerely with great, with great yearning, he said, but how do you know that God exists? How do you know? And in that moment, because I loved him so dearly, I sincerely wanted to give him how I knew. But it's an odd thing, actually. I want you to pause and consider. How do you know that God is real? And in that moment, be born of the desperation to try and convey to him the essence, the bedrock of my faith, my heart burst at the impossibility of that task. And I started to weep in front of him because how could I possibly begin to tell you how I know that God exists? And as the tears fell down my cheeks, I began to try and exclaim, to, to explain to him, I, I see him in the dancing flowers. I feel his power in the roar of thunder. I feel his aspiration in the nobility of the mountains. I feel his beauty in the flow of music. And I feel his love for me in your very smile. I, I said, how can you not see him? He's everywhere. And he resides even on the throne of my own heart when there I retire in silence and stillness. And it was profoundly moving to me because in that moment I realized that that faith was something no one could ever take away from me because it was the very essence of my own experience. But in that moment it also broke my heart because I watched my friend look at me and be incapable of perceiving what I myself knew. And it was exceedingly painful because I could not give to him that realization which I had won because he was not yet ready to receive that understanding. And that is the understanding that these two passages from these scriptures are inviting us to today. The topic, did God create the universe or become it? This is not just a pop trivia spiritual question. It's not, oh, I know the answer, he became it. But this is something that we ought to consider deeply. Do you understand this in the marrow of your bones? Do you feel the reality of this truth when you go throughout your daily lives? Because if you do, this will transform you. I have a hypothesis 
that any of the Sunday service topics that Swami Kriyananda outlines for us throughout the year, any one of them, if we were to perfectly understand, we'd be liberated. But in fact, we can go further and we can say that anything, if perfectly understood, must bring us to God, for there is no other perfection. But I began to wonder to myself, just a few moments ago actually, I thought, now what is it that brought me to the point where I could tell my friend I see him everywhere? What brought me to that realization? What empowered me to be capable of saying that, not as empty words, but as a living testimony? And I have two insights to offer to you, which are not my own, but which come from Swami Kriyananda to which I can merely add my own testimony. And the first is that Swamiji says, Swami Kriyananda, for those of you who don't know, was Yogananda's direct disciple and whose picture we have on the right side of the altar there by the flowers in the right alcove. And he was the greatest man of wisdom that I ever had the great pleasure of meeting. But Swamiji writes that the more our awareness is external to ourselves, the more we define the world and our experience of it, by the senses and by the external phenomenon, the less capable we are of perceiving truth. And the more we interiorize our awareness, the more we begin to understand the essence of who we are and the essence of reality, which is love, which is joy. As that beautiful song said that we sang just a moment before, what is joy? Is it just a dream? Or does joy laugh in every stream? How do we begin to see the joy of God laughing in every stream? Well, by learning to withdraw and interiorize our awareness. And that's what had been happening to me prior to that experience. About six months before that moment with my friend, by the grace of God, I don't know why other than that, I woke up on a New Year's Day and my New Year's resolution without any preamble, without any preconception, I woke up and I decided that I would meditate twice a day, starting today. And so I woke up, I rolled up, and I started practicing the Hong Sa technique, which like I mentioned, I had been taught since a child. And by the grace of God, I have managed to continue that practice until today. And so I began interiorizing my awareness through the scientific practice of meditation and through that meditation, I began to realize that the essence of my own nature was none other than joy, it was none other than peace, it was none other than dynamic, all-conquering power. And so I invite all of you in this time of new beginnings and new years, make the great resolution to go within, to find yourself in the temple of silence and to worship God in that silence. But then the other thing that I began doing right around that time, which is um, something that I hadn't actually put together until just recently, was I was also expanding and exploring my heart through the arts. And what's very interesting is Swami Kriyananda, in his book, Art as a Hidden Message, he invites each and every one of us to be an artist. But what he also says is that it doesn't matter what medium you explore or through which you express yourself, but that it is important that you try. And that he says, because the essence of all consciousness is chitta, is the heart, is the feeling nature, that through the arts we learn to expand our feeling nature and we learn to see that the very essence of our own capacity to experience is not even our own. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And so at this point in my life, as it happens, I was exploring the artistic medium of being an actor. And I was playing the role of Tony in the musical West Side Story. The funny thing is, I didn't actually enjoy the musical, but there I was, I was doing it. And as I was meditating and then playing this role, I began experimenting and exploring the attitude of trying to see God as the doer. Because anyone who has had a deep experience in any artistic medium, be it painting or music or leadership or parenting, there will come a moment when you experience such an intense flow of inspiration that you become absorbed in that inspiration. 
And in that absorption, you forget your own little self and you become enraptured in a grace, in a presence of the divine. And so I was consciously practicing that in my artistic medium. And it was very interesting. There was one particular performance when backstage I sat and I prayed to God, that was my preparation, and I said, Lord, how about we try an experiment today? How about you come play the part and I'll watch? And I had a very interesting experience. I was very sincere, and Yogananda said that sometimes at the beginning, a spiritual aspirant is, giving, is given sort of more spiritual experiences than they might otherwise deserve. And I think I fell handily into that category for I had a very particular experience that evening of really feeling that God was playing the role through me. I felt almost as if I was outside of my own body, looking down. I distinctly recall still singing one of the musical numbers that was particularly challenging, and that evening it was sung perfectly, and I got to witness it. And I remember feeling like I was watching myself and the audience, and I heard the music come out, and I thought, wow, how about that, it worked. But that experience taught me something, that God exists and he flows through me because it took only a thimble full of humility to recognize that, gee, all other hundred times that I sang that song, I never sang it right. But the one time that I asked God to sing it and I felt this overwhelming presence of joy, it came out right, suspicious. And so through that artistic medium, I began to realize that the greatest potential of my own life was not to be me, but was to allow God to come through me. And we experience this in any artistic form. When you look at a musician who's truly having a transcendent experience, they're no longer just playing notes in a particular pattern, pattern at a particular pitch and with a certain rhythm, but they're becoming the music. And when I was a young boy, I used to win musical competitions, not because of my technical competency, but because of my capacity to forget myself in the joy of the music. My own cello instructor was flabbergasted year after year. He said, Keshava, I don't know how, but you play the very best I've ever heard you in your life on the day of the competition. How is that? And in retrospect, I can tell you, because in that moment, my consciousness was absorbed in trying to share the joy I feel in music. And any musician can tell you, when the music overtakes you, you cease to be you, but you become the music. And this is what God has done for this whole world. He has become the whole world. He has become you, and he has become me. And he has become the flight of birds and the tall trees and the sunsets and the squealing horns and screeching brakes on El Camino. He's everything. And so I invite you, find that way in which you can practice feeling the inspiration of God flowing through you until you can begin to feel yourself surrendering the little identification of your ego into that divine current. And that can happen through meditation. It can happen through chanting. That beautiful chant that they chose this morning, when thy song flows through me. That's precisely what it's speaking of. An excellent choice. And so if you want to experience this, take that chant. Sing it all the time until you begin to feel the divine Lord singing through you. But we cannot idly pray that these experiences come we must marry together these two things, this interiorization of our awareness and our sincere self-offering to become a channel of that grace into the world. And the more we do that, the more very naturally and spontaneously we will begin to see his hidden presence everywhere in the flight of the clouds and in everything. That beautiful song that we sang as a choir, What is Love? It's one of my all-time favorites. And it moves me so deeply every time I hear it sung. And there's one line in particular that says, God is dead, so men say. Can't they see all life's his play? Not a church binds him as its own. Not a creed makes him fully known. And then this second part, which is my 
favorite. He goes, foolish we if we limit him. Every atom is his throne. That's actually what this reading is inviting us to understand. Every atom is his throne. And if you can begin to experience that, not as an intellectual thought, but as a revelation, it will transform your life. And this one idea will rescue you from the pits of despair and nihilism and a pointlessness that could drive you easily to such great pain. It was very interesting. When I, uh, just a few years ago, joined the Living Wisdom High School, which is the educational model presented by Yogananda and Swami Kriyananda, uh, which was quite an unexpected adventure. I think there's, a, there's like a policy in the Living Wisdom High School that whenever a new faculty member joins, there's like a hazing process. And that you have to ask them to stretch themselves in some parameter far beyond their prior expectations. And so I hear, you know, Hazi had to um, teach kindergarten PE. That was his hazing period for a year. <laughs> and I'm glad that wasn't mine. <laughs> I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> but what mine was, was I was asked to teach biology. They said, hey, can you teach biology in three months? And I said, yeah. And then I walked out and I thought, okay, that was really confident. Now let's see if we can do it, God. And so I went and I began studying and I practiced all of the techniques that Swami Kriyananda recommended. He mentioned that when he was in college, he passed a dire Greek test by studying the night before, primarily with the affirmation of saying, I am Greek, I am Greek, I am Greek, I am Greek. And by that strength of his affirmation, drawing the magnetism for success. And so I did the same thing. I said, I am a biologist, I'm a biologist, I'm a biologist. And I listened to biology podcasts and I read biology books and I thought of myself in that way and I prayed to God, teach me the, the, the mysteries of the DNA and how to remember what the DNA even stands for. <laughs> and so it was, it was a great adventure of willpower, desperate prayer, and, uh, you know, pressure. But at one point, I joined uh, a local college class just to, you know, sort of brush up a little bit. And it was amazing because there was one experience that highlights this in particular, which I'd like to share. Because if one is able to see God everywhere, it changes the way you see everything. And so here I was studying with these other students, and I felt suddenly very much like an old man. Um, my hairline was more receding than anyone else's in the room, and, <laughs> and uh, all of the students would look to me to ask for how to do the things, and I said, I don't know what I'm doing, but I guess I can fake it better than you can. But at one moment, we were examining through a telescope, no, microscope. <laughs> <laughs> Humility is self-honesty. Listen, it's fine. <laughs> We're looking through a microscope at leaves. These very, very thin leaves. And, I, you know, as happens in these settings, the teacher asked, okay, who would like to come up and get their leaf specimen first? And everyone is not wanting to be that person. And I thought, I can do it. So I strode forward boldly and got my leaf specimen and got back to my telescope, microscope. <laughs> And uh, you guys are quick. You should caught it before I did. And I slid my, my slide under the microscope. And as it would happen, as fate would have it, my station was immediately next to all the other equipment, uh, like the leaves and the slides and all that. So all of the students were huddled around me the moment I looked through the microscope for the first time. And I looked through the microscope, and I got it into focus, and I saw there all the little chloroplasts, all the little green guys that synthesize light into carbohydrates, which if you've been a little while since biology class, it's a miracle. It's just a miracle. And I saw all those little highly organized green little specks, and I felt, I kid you not, a wave of energy surge up my spine 
at witnessing the presence of divine intelligence. I felt like I was seeing God. I felt this inspiration shoot up my spine, this joy, and I cried out, my God, it's so beautiful. And everyone's head snaps over at me. <laughs> but you know, it was interesting. I was deeply inspired by that. I don't think another student in the room was as deeply moved as I was. I am not a biologist. <laughs> I will not pursue that as my life's calling. And yet, when I saw that, it moved me deeply. And then just a few weeks later in class, we were trying, the teacher was trying to describe the difference between a living cell and a dead cell. And basically, it came out to be that, well, there's almost like no real perceptible difference like at the moment, except for like all of a sudden it just stops. And I don't know how to articulate what happened to me, but in that moment, again, I felt this great wave of inspiration rise up my spine. You cannot isolate what life is in test tubes or in microscopes, for life can never die. The presence of life is what makes our bodies form. It is what makes the flight patterns of birds, and it never dies. It merely leaves and will come again. Now, it was very interesting, just to conclude this, is that at the end of that course of study, the professor asked us to either go attend an outside lecture on biology, volunteer for some eco-societies, or write or create an original piece of art based on our inspiration from the course. And I thought, well, that's the easiest one for me. So I sat down and I wrote a poem, because for whatever reason, God inspires me often in the form of words. But what I've discovered is that I can't write poetry mechanically. If you tell me, Keshava, go write a, poet a poem on these parameters, uh. But how I write poetry is when my heart is so full that it's about to burst, it bursts in the form of words. And those words are how I am often inspired to share the inspiration of the divine with others. But so I sat down and I thought, well, I can write a poem, and I've been very inspired through this study. And I also thought this would be my way of trying to bless my professor, perhaps with a little awareness of a deeper way of relating to life. And so I sat down and I asked God, write this poem through me. And I just had fun. And I found a rhyming rhythm and I found a style and I wrote a poem. And she mentioned that she really enjoyed it. But I highlight this because this ties together and shows the marriage of the two things that I wanted to discuss today. An interiorized and inner awareness, which is the essence of our true awareness, leads to the ability to perceive God everywhere. And then by entering and offering ourselves as a channel of that infinite intelligence, we learn to perceive ourselves also as a part of that divine flow. So I'll end now by reading that poem for you, just for fun. I don't claim this to be the next Shakespearean sonnets, but it's entertaining. So I titled this, I am that which cannot die. I am that which cannot die. At the heart of every being am I. I circulate in earth and spreading sky. I am the first inhalation and final sigh. I am that which makes the plants to grow. I am that which makes the rivers flow. I am that which makes your body know which cells to eat and which to sow. I am the code of inheritance which has long endured. I am the secret of every disease that cannot be cured. I am the destruction of every being assured. I am why the young look with eyes allured. I am the inexplicable within the mundane. I am the sanity amidst the random and insane. I am the complexity within the plain. I am the reason you endure pain. I am the architect of the noblest kind. I built the wonders contained in every mind. I built every fossil left behind. I built all that man will ever find. I keep primordial powers in flux and still. 
I sustain your blood, your body, your will. I dissolve all discarded forms and bring to nil. I use their forms, my fields to till. I am the light which powers plants to breathe. I am the hands which labor and weave. I am that which you can never leave. I am that which gone you may never retrieve. I am the predator stalking its prey. I am the speckled fawn born in May. I am the family split by water and clay. I am the bridge between night and day. I am the bond between atoms small. I am the forming of mountains tall. I am the song of every mating call. I am shriveled leaves in the waning fall. I am every species ever grown. I make my seat upon the throne of every last discarded bone upon which light has ever shone. I am the varied hues of peacock's plume. I am the child growing within the womb. I am the mouths which eat the tomb. I lie invisibly in every room. I am the joy, the apathy, and the strife. I am hope and despair both running rife. I am the husband, daughter, son, and wife. Lo, behold me, I am life. God bless you, friends. I hope you have a wonderful week and a year of inspiration drawing you ever closer to God. Take a moment. In India there lived by the banks of a stream A hermit whose prayers chose applause for that theme He gazed at the flowers and he smiled at the sun Then he clapped with delight
see.